watching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Is Putin the savior of Christianity? Does he uphold Christian values? We will <clears throat> discuss these questions and even others. Joined by Father Deacon Anthony to navigate these uh, confusing times and troubled waters and to give us some answers here. Uh, Father Deacon, good to have you on. How are you? Oh, good. It's always good to see you, Michael. appreciate yeah. having me on here. These shows are always fun. I really look forward to your impact or your your uh, perspective. You're a Ukrainian Catholic deacon, so I think your perspective mm -hmm. is incredibly helpful here. So I'm really looking forward to this one. You know, I saw on social media, <clears throat> I've seen actually a lot of instances of this where people are claiming and defending what's going on right now. Um, I'm part of Russia in Ukraine as this victory or not necessarily victory but um as the position of the conservatives they think that okay well what russia is doing is really the work of conservative christianity over against the immoral west and so of course it's it's fitting to ask this question well is putin the savior of christianity does he uphold moral uh Christian moral values? Is that really what in fact is going on? So maybe uh, if, if you could kind of introduce us to this issue. Yes. So I've been seeing a lot of posts on social media from people who, um, who are conservative Catholics or conservative Orthodox Christians who are actually cheering on Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Um, and I have some friends who have taken this position, including people I know in real life, not just online people, but people I know in the flesh and blood spent time with who are who believe who are convinced that Putin is in the right and uh, uh, I want to address that I want to address that and I want to address it from a couple of angles so first of all I want to explain why I think people are buying into this and I think a lot of it has to do with what we've witnessed in the past several years with the media um, I think it's fair to say that the mainstream media uh, has agendas a lot of people have learned not to trust the media I don't trust the media. And during the whole, you know, COVID lockdown situation, we're getting all kinds of conflicting stories. Uh, the same thing, you know, for a number of years, whatever you think of Trump, we were being told by the media that he was a Russian agent. Uh, for several years, we were told that it turned out not to be true. Um, so at this point, people are not buying into any narrative that the media is spinning. And I understand that. I get it. I get it. So when they hear the media demonizing Putin, talking about Putin's atrocities, Putin being, you know, Hitler 2.0 and all of this stuff, they assume that the media is wrong yet again. Uh, that being said, just because the media is against someone doesn't mean that that person is in the right. That's the key thing we have to remember here. Now, I want to preface this by saying that my information that I'm getting about the situation in Ukraine is not coming from the media. I'm getting the information from Ukrainian Catholics on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, the main place I look is to the Ukrainian Catholic bishops. The head of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, Patriarch Svatoslav, a truly good, holy man, is in Ukraine right now. He's in Kyiv. He's in a safe house in Kyiv. He had the opportunity to leave Ukraine when the invasion began. He chose to stay in Kyiv to be with his people, to minister to God's people, even though it's an established fact now that he is on Putin's kill list. Um, same thing with the head of the Ukrainian Orthodox, or the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, I should say. He is also on Putin's kill list. They both are. That's, that's a fact. Uh, they both chose to stay. They both chose to be there to minister to God's people. So that's where I'm looking for my information. I'm not getting my information from CNN or Fox News or, you know, Rachel Maddow or Anderson Cooper. I'm getting it directly from people I trust in Ukraine, both the bishops, but also friends I have who are there as well. I have friends who are on the ground who are trying to get the word out as to what's really taking place. So to those who are watching here who may be inclined to believe Putin because the media is demonizing him, um, the media is wrong about a lot of stuff. They have agendas. But in this particular case, 
um, a lot of the stuff you're hearing about Putin actually is true. But again, I understand that's why people are not trusting narrative, and I don't blame them. We should question narratives. We shouldn't just buy into it. We've seen uh, us as a nation, the United States, being drawn into war after war after war, in many cases on, under false pretexts, right? You know, uh, who must go to war against Saddam Hussein because of weapons of mass destruction. They were never found, things of that nature. Um, so again, I'm all for being skeptical. But in this case, the stories you're hearing are true. He really is committing these atrocities. He really is doing this largely unprovoked. So I want to address that. But somewhere along the line, there's this narrative that's been spun that Putin is the champion of Christianity or the champion of Christians. Uh, I'll, I'll share with you how I first came across this and how I came to question it. So years ago, uh, when the civil war was taking place in Syria, uh, the United States uh, took one side, Russia took the other. You know, Russia was actually uh, on the side of the Assad regime. And as an Eastern Catholic, I had missed, mixed feelings about this. On one hand, uh, Assad is clearly uh, a tyrant. He's a butcher. Uh, he has no regard for human life. On the other hand, the Assad family, uh, for generations, defended the Christian minority in Syria against uh, Islamic zealots who wanted them dead. So Putin took the side of the Assad family, and part of the pretext he gave was that he was defending the Christians of Syria. And a lot of people bought into this. And when I heard that narrative, I thought, well, maybe there's some truth to it. I didn't know enough at the time to judge it to be true one way or the other. But that's where I first came across this idea of Putin being the champion of Christianity, because he was working with Assad under the pretext of defending the Christian minority in Syria, who, if the Islamic radicals took control, would undoubtedly be butchered. I didn't really start to question this, though, until a few years later. I want to say it was in 2012. This is an interesting story. I'm going to be perfectly vague here. I'm going to be rather vague because uh, I don't want to get anyone in any danger. But in 2012, I was invited to speak at a, a conference in a, a major American city. And at this conference, um, I was introduced to somebody from Russia. I was introduced to an official from the Patriarchate of Moscow. Uh, a fellow who was uh, pretty important in the Patriarchate of Moscow, uh, a member of the clergy, somebody with a position of significant influence. And I hit it off with this guy. I hit it off with him. He was, he was an intellectual. He was a scholar. And we started talking for a period of time. And then later on, we went out to dinner. A couple of friends joined us, a couple of mutual friends. And when we were at dinner, uh, you know, we kind of loosened up and started sharing things more openly and honestly. And this individual uh, from the Moscow Patriarchate began to tell me things about Putin I'd never heard before. Uh, some of the things he said, I'm not going to repeat because I can't verify they're true, but there are things that are pretty shocking to hear. He had no love for Putin, none. But then he told me that Putin had an ambition, a dream. He wanted to rebuild the Soviet Union. He wanted to bring it back. And he said, this individual said that the policies of America in that time period in 2012 uh, were weak and they were enabling Putin to bring back the Soviet Union. He said all this and I listened to him attentively, but I wasn't sure whether, what to believe or not. I mean, this fellow, he knew Putin personally. He met him, you know, he knew him, but he told me this, that Putin had this dream. Well, about a year and a half later in, in 2014, uh, Putin invades Crimea. And that's when it first occurred to me what that fellow said is true. Putin really has this ambition. And I see, I see right now what's taking place is that ambition is extending. Uh, he's working towards re rebuilding the Soviet Union or the old Russian Empire or something. He wants territory, just like uh, Hitler used to say the Germans needed breathing room. Uh, you know, Putin seems to think that Russia needs to reclaim the footprint of the old Russian Empire. So that's part of what's going on here. Uh, but I, again, I want to speak to those individuals who are thinking that Putin is somehow the champion of Christianity. So you may have heard about this. 
for many, many centuries, there was a prophecy that there'd be uh, the last Roman emperor or the, you know, the holy emperor or the, or the, or the, or the, or the great Christian monarch. That there'd be this uh, figure who'd rise up in the end times who would restore, you know, the, the Christian church, be the champion of Christianity. I'm seeing people online claiming as Putin. And that deeply disturbs me. But again, I want to explain why it disturbs me. So people are buying into this narrative that Putin is the champion of Christianity. And part of it is he's very strongly opposed, at least vocally, vocally on the surface, um, to many of the values of the West that are antithetical to Christianity. You know, in Russia, there, there are no gay pride parades, as Patriarch Kirill reminded us. Um, you know, in Russia, uh, you don't have the same kind of, you know, gender ideology that is causing our high school students to think that they're the opposite sex. Uh, that's not going on in Russia. Uh, the, a lot of the pretty strange things that happen in the United States uh, are curtailed or outlawed in Russia. So on the surface, that makes it appear to be a place that's more hospitable to Christian values. I remember a few years back, I saw this story about a, um, a Russian Orthodox priest here in the United States. And this fellow was originally Protestant. He became Orthodox. He was a deacon for a while, became a priest. And he had a, a big family. And he decided to move his country, sorry, to move his family to Russia. You remember that story? I, I, I read can't the story. Say that I've heard this one. It, it's it not was ringing a bell. So, yes, this, this Russian Orthodox priest relocated his entire family to Russia. And he had an interview from Russia in which he said how wonderful it felt to be away from the corruption of the United States, the evils of the West, and to live in a truly Christian country. And uh, that's how he felt. And again, I've seen a lot of people, both Orthodox and Catholic, thinking the same thing about Russia. Um, so I, I see how they, how they fall into that trap because they hear Putin, you know, trying to limit abortion, doing all kinds of things that sounds wonderful to us from a Christian perspective. But here's the thing people don't grasp. Putin is not the champion of Christianity. He's not the champion of Catholicism. He is the champion of Caesaropapism. The Christianity he is pushing is a specific brand of Christianity that has a long history in Russia of the church being subservient to the state. Uh, you know, for centuries, whether it was the czar or whether it was the communists or whether it's Putin, the Russian church has been controlled and subjugated to the state. And those brave Russian Christians who opposed that oftentimes met an untimely demise. You know, thousands and thousands of Orthodox priests were killed uh, by the Soviets because they refused to go along with the, the communists controlling their church. But the church was allowed to function uh, because they had parishes run by priests who oftentimes collaborated with the KGB. Um, the church was controlled by the state. The current head of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill, uh, it's documented that he was a KGB officer, not just a collaborator, but an actual officer in the KGB, as was Putin. Um, and Putin, at this point, really has control over that church. Uh, Patriarch Kirill is subservient to Putin. The Russian Orthodox Church doesn't speak up against Putin. Putin has control. And the church has become an organ of the state once again in Russia. So the Christianity that Putin is championing and the Christianity he would spread to Ukraine if he takes over Ukraine is that type of Christianity. Again, Caesaropapism, a church completely subservient to the Russian state. Um, so let's talk for a second about what happened the last time that Russia conquered Ukraine. The last time that Russia took control of Ukraine, um, immediately they made certain that the Ukrainian Orthodox Christians became subservient to the Russian Patriarchate, to Moscow. And those Russian Orthodox clergy and faithful who resisted, again, met untimely deaths. They were sent to gulags, to concentration camps. Um, many, though, collaborated because they saw that as the only way to stay open and to minister to the people in some way. Now, the Ukrainian Catholic Church, my church, was outlawed 
it was outlawed by Russia. And the Ukrainian Catholic Church had to go completely underground. Um, they actually had a fake synod that the, the Soviets orchestrated in which supposedly um, the, the Ukrainian Catholics uh, returned to their mother church of Moscow, which by the way was never the mother church, uh, and became you know true Orthodox Christians. But the reality is the Ukrainian, or the Ukrainian Catholic Church went underground and it existed that way uh, for quite a long time. It was at the time the largest illegal religious body in the world. 3,000 of our priests at least were killed. Uh, countless faithful were, were, were murdered by the Soviets. <clears throat> during that period, um, the patriarch of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, during that, that long captivity, uh, you know, Patriarch Slepe, he was imprisoned. He was in prison for about 20 years. And he wrote during that time that the Ukrainian Catholic Church had been buried under piles of corpses, you know, and rivers of blood. That was true as a church of martyrs. My church, the Ukrainian Catholic Church, still is a church of martyrs. And we know that if Russia gets control of Ukraine again, we will once again be outlawed. We will once again go into the underground. Now, how can we be so certain we're going to be outlawed? Well, look at Russia right now. The Ukrainian Catholic Church is at present outlawed in Russia. You cannot be a Ukrainian Catholic in Russia. It's against the law. So that's going to extend to Ukraine as well. So the Ukrainian Catholic Church, once again, will be driven underground. We're not going to vanish. For us, functioning in the catacombs is a living memory with people alive who lived through that. Um, we'll keep going. We'll keep going. But we remember how awful it was during that time period. I'll give you another example of that. So I'm assigned to two parishes, one uh, in the town of Revlock, another one in a town called Northern Cambria. And the parish in Northern Cambria has a, a beautiful church building that looks like an old wooden church that came out of Eastern Europe. Um, it's actually relatively new, but it looks like an old school you know, wooden church you'd, like you'd find on a hillside somewhere in Ukraine. It was built by a priest named Father Myron. Father Myron um, was a Ukrainian Catholic priest who refused to renounce his Catholic faith. He was sent to a concentration camp along with his wife and daughter. His wife and daughter were killed in the concentration camp. Father Myron managed to escape. And he came here to the United States and he raised the money and he built that church. He made it look like an old school wooden church from Eastern Europe to be a tribute to the Christians of Eastern Europe who are suffering for their faith. Um, that's the kind of thing we're looking at happening again. You know, right now, in, in Russia even, there, are, there was a priest arrested uh, because he gave a homily urging peace homily against the invasion of Ukraine. He was arrested. Um, there are a number of Orthodox priests in Ukraine who have been kidnapped in recent weeks, again, because they were not subject themselves to the Moscow Patriarchate. So if Russia gets control of Ukraine, the first thing to vanish will be religious freedom. Religious freedom will be gone. There is no religious freedom in Russia. There will be no religious freedom in Ukraine. The Ukrainian or the um, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, the OCU, the you know the autocephalous Ukrainian Orthodox Church, uh, will again be forced to subject subject itself to Moscow. A lot of them won't, and they'll go underground. Some might, but the Ukrainian Catholic Church will be outlawed, and we will be hunted like we were hunted before. Uh, again, getting to the argument as to whether or not Putin is this great Christian hero, as I said before. It's documented that on Putin's hit list, he has two Christian leaders. He has the, the head of the Ukrainian Catholic Church and the head of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine on his hit list. He is targeting two Christian bishops for assassination. <clears throat> There's nothing Christian about that. That is evil. That is evil. Now, again, I imagine there are people hearing all this and saying, well, you, you know, you're getting all your information from the media. The media can't be trusted. Again, I'm getting my information from my bishops, from my patriarch, people who I do trust, people who are faithful to God and who are faithful to the church. They're not lying. They're not making this up. They're speaking the truth. And I'm urging all of the Catholic and Orthodox Christians out there who are listening, 
and all Christians of goodwill to heed this message. Christianity, religious freedom is in danger in Ukraine. We cannot glorify and glamorize a man who's not a champion of Christianity, but is a champion of the state ruling over the church. We cannot have that. That's why I'll pause. Where, where are we getting this information about several Ukrainian Catholic bishops being on a hit list? Well, the only ones I can say for certain are on the hit list is the head of the Ukrainian or the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. And the other one is the head of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. We know this because intelligence was shared with them and with the church. And uh, I've, if you want, I can send you a couple links. Um, so, for example, yeah. the head of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine... Uh, Metropolitan uh, Epiphanani, I believe it's pronounced, uh, he was told by intelligence agencies that he's number five on the hit list. Um, likewise, the head of my church was also given information that he is on Putin's kill list as well. And that was verified in a statement given by the head of the Ukrainian Catholic Church in the United States, Metropolitan Boris. Uh, he recently gave an interview in which he divulged this information that our patriarch is in fact on the kill list. But again, these are people I trust completely. What was your reaction whenever you read Vigano's letter recently, where he spoke of Russia being the third Rome and even spoke of, you know, what, what's going on today with Russia in terms of biblical prophecy and, and in fact, the role of the Holy Spirit that holds back the Antichrist? He attributes potentially to russia so but what did you think of that when you read that um when i first read that uh, i made the following statement it read as if it was written by putin and patriarch carol i mean it, it was their party line it was their propaganda mm -hmm. um it didn't sound like anything a catholic bishop would ever write now is it pronounced Vigano or, or, or Vigano? I forget. Uh, you know, I usually hear Vigano. But okay, we'll, we'll go imagine. with Vigano. Yeah, we'll yeah. go with Vigano. So, <laughs> you know, I've read some of Vigano's other stuff. I read some interviews with him. You know, initially when he first uh, came out as a whistleblower, I, I had some respect for the guy. Um, his messages have gotten increasingly erratic and more and more laden with conspiracy theories. They've become very, very political, not very Christ-centered. Um, I've been questioning for a while whether he's actually writing this stuff. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But this last letter, it was literally the Russian talking points. The Russian talking points you hear from Putin and the Russian, you know, Moscow patriarchate talking points that you hear from Kirill. Mm -hmm. it, it sounded to me like they actually wrote it. Now, did they write it? No. But I'm sure that he basically had a list of their talking points in front of him as he wrote it, if he did, in fact, write it. Where he got that list from, I don't know. Maybe he has people whispering in his ear. Um, but that letter did not reflect a Christian worldview. It was the Russian worldview enshrined in a letter written by a Catholic archbishop. Father Jason Sharon, who, whom I've had on the show and was recently on Matt Frad's um, Pints with Aquinas, did an interview where he goes over Vigano's um, letter and he kind of said something along those lines. Did you get a chance to catch that video by any chance? I did. I did. And I think I agree with Father Jason's analysis completely. I yeah. mean, he seems to think that perhaps um, the Russian Orthodox Metropolitan Hilarion uh, fed information yeah. to Vigano. I think that's very possible. You know, Hilarion is very connected. He gets a lot of respect in the West. Um, but those who've been following the situation know that he's a two faced snake. I, I mean, just speaking honestly here as an Eastern Catholic, he wants to see me vanish, right? So it's very possible he fed information to, to Vigano. So <clears throat> talking a little bit more about whether or not he's the Christian monarch, could you briefly touch on this idea of a Christian monarch? What, what exactly is that? The, this but, prophecy of a Christian yeah. monarch? Yeah. It, you know, it, it, you can't find it in one place explained coherently. There are little scraps of it here and there, but a lot of a lot of mystics and prophets and saints had had a prophecy that, you know, either before the Antichrist or at the time of the Antichrist, there would be a, a Christian ruler who would come, who would um, 
who basically create an era of peace for a period of time and who would put the church on a strong foundation, on a strong footing before the Antichrist arose. Um, that's one version of it. I've seen other versions as well. The timeline isn't too clear. Is there something to it? There might be. There might be something to it. I wouldn't dismiss it out of hand. Um, but I don't at all line up with the idea of this Christian monarch being the same person who's bombing maternity hospitals, the same person who is literally putting hits out on Christian bishops. Um, I don't buy that. I don't buy that for a minute. But what would you say in response to patriarchs talking points about gay pride parades in Ukraine and things like that? And whereas in Russia, they don't have those things. How is it that they're not champions of Christian values? Right. So I look at it this way. Just because somebody is wrong about some things doesn't mean they're not right on other things and vice versa. So you can have uh, people, you can have a nation, you can have a, a leader who's right about a lot of stuff and really wrong on some other things. And that could be the case here. Um, I remember reading uh, years back about how in Russia and China, there's strict rules regarding movies and films as to, as to how much of a, a gay or transsexual agenda they can put in there. And apparently a lot of Hollywood movies were scaling back you know, the LGBTQ alphabet factor so they could actually show these movies in places like China or Russia. And I'm not an expert on this, but from what I've read, it seemed to me that if it wasn't for China and Russia, that every Hollywood movie, like every character would be gay or transsexual. Uh, they'd be shoving it down our throats constantly, but they shove it down our throats less because they want to sell tickets in China. Um, does that mean that China is the champion of Christianity? Absolutely not. Uh, uh, but in some things, they could profess things that might line up with traditional Christian values. But at the same time, they're doing other things that tr dramatically go against what we believe as Christians. So it's possible to be right on some things, but wrong about others. Uh, Ukraine, on the other hand, um, for better or for worse, has modeled itself after the West. And it's modeled itself after the United States in many ways. And, you know, in the month of June, we're going to have pride parades everywhere. And most cities will have giant gay pride flags all over the place. And everyone's going to be celebrating it and dancing in the streets. And it's unfortunate, in my opinion. It's unfortunate. Uh, again, I have friends who are gay. I, I have a lot of respect and love for them as people. But as a Christian, as a Catholic, I stand by the traditional Christian teaching on this. And if somebody wants to live that life and that's their life, it's not my business. But is it really necessary to shove it down the throat of an entire nation and to shove it down the throat of children in schools, right? That's a whole other story. Um, but Ukraine has modeled itself after us. So they have the gay pride parades like we do. They have the lax abortion laws like we have. Um, and again, a lot of the people online I see who are championing Putin, a lot of the Catholics I see who are cheering on Putin, um, point to that fact, how Ukraine has these corrupt moral values and Russia doesn't. Um, at least on the surface, they don't. Uh, my response is, okay, then would you be okay with, with our country being invaded and your neighborhood being blown up, your church being bombed, your hospital being destroyed? Are you okay with that? Because anything Thing that Ukraine is guilty of in this regard, we're just as guilty and we're probably even more guilty here. Does that mean that America deserves to be invaded and its people slaughtered? Some are claiming, but all this is just, you know, hype in the media and it's really um, misleading content. This isn't actually what's taking place in Ukraine. Um, what would you say to people who bring that objection? Again, trust the people on the ground who represent the Catholic Church. If you claim to be a Catholic, listen to our bishops there. Listen to the head of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. He himself ministered to people in the underground when our faith was illegal. He risked his life to minister to people. He's not lying. He's not a stooge. He's not repeating media talking points. He and the other Ukrainian Catholic bishops actually wrote an amazing encyclical against transgenderism. Hmm. It's one of the best documents ever written on that subject. It was written by the Ukrainian Catholic Patriarch and Synod, explaining hmm. the dangers of gender ideology. This 
patriarch, my patriarch is on your side. He is a champion of traditional Christian values. He would not be lying about this. He would not be making this up. He wouldn't be going along with some you know, media agenda. He's speaking the truth as he sees it, and he's seeing people die all around him. I kind of wonder why is it that you have, I mean, Russian Orthodoxy is the official state religion in Russia, and yet you have, as you noted there, abortion legalized. I just kind of wonder how is, is that possible? Any, any comments there? Yeah, that, that's been raised before. Now, I guess Putin, to his credit, did try and make it a little harder. I think now you, you have a waiting period. I think there are mandatory waiting periods, mandatory counseling before you can get an abortion. Uh, that's my understanding, at least. So he's made some policies that put some obstacles in the way to make it a little easier. I think a big part of it is under the Soviets, um, abortion was treated like contraception. Mm. Uh, and, and that was the case in most countries under Soviet rule. Abortion was treated like contraception. So uh, it's hard to stamp that out. But yes, you know, Putin does have control over the government. And he is supposedly a devout Orthodox Christian. He could do more to stop it. He really could. Um, but it's still, it's still legal there. It's still legal there. What about this idea that, well, what they're trying to do is get rid of neo-Nazis in Ukraine? Any, any thoughts on that one? Right. So first of all, uh, I'm going to say this. Let's say for a moment that we concede. I'm not, but let's say we concede and say there really are neo-Nazis functioning in Ukraine doing horrible things. Mm -hmm. Even if that's true, does that legitimize going into the country with a wholesale invasion and attacking civilian populations? Does that justify putting hits out on bishops? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. That being said, the, the stories of Ukraine being dominated by neo-Nazis um, is, as far as I can tell, largely false. Now, apparently there are some neo-Nazi militias in parts of Ukraine, or so they claim. Uh, I can't verify that one way or the other. Um, but I will say that the narrative that the Ukrainian government is controlled by Nazis doesn't add up. Uh, first of all, again, it's been pointed out many times, the president of Ukraine is Jewish. Um, I can't imagine this guy who lost family members in the Holocaust siding with Nazis and being a stooge of Nazis. Now, I have seen people on social media claiming that he works for the Nazis and they purposely put a Jewish person as their front man so they can't be accused of being what they are, Nazis. And these same articles and these same videos went on to explain how the government of Ukraine is funded by George Soros. <sighs> George Soros is Jewish. Uh, if Ukraine is run by Nazis, how is it being funded by George Soros? Uh, again, and I'm not saying that's true, but I'm just saying none of this really adds up. All these conspiracy theories kind of contradict each other in various levels. Speaking of conspiracy theories, what would you say to those who say, well, this idea that there's a hit out on these bishops is a conspiracy and it was something leaked by Russia? What would you say of this idea? That, well, this is just, you know, propaganda and conspiracies leaked by Russia deliberately. <laughs> These bishops were given intelligence uh, from intelligence sources that they trust. I have no reason to doubt them. Um, I think in this particular case, a lot of the intelligence we've seen has been right. Uh, mm. There were months there, or at least a month there, where they were saying that, that Russia was going to invade Ukraine. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. Uh, a lot of people I know on the ground in Ukraine did not believe it. They thought Putin wouldn't actually do that. Uh, probably most people in Ukraine didn't really believe it, but the intelligence kept saying was going to happen. It, it happened. Um, but my understanding is these bishops have been warned by, by governments who have viable intelligence saying that this is the case. Now, um, would Russia leak that on purpose? Why? I don't know. Why would they do that? Yeah. <clears throat> For those who might still remain skeptical and just say, look, I, I don't really know what's going on. It's hard for me to trust the social media. And, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure about the information that I'm getting about, you know, what's going on in Ukraine from the Ukrainian bishops Any anything else that they could possibly consider. At a certain point, you've got to you've got to be open to some things being true. Uh, 
Yeah. You can't constantly wear a tinfoil hat on your head 24 right. seven. If you can't, if you can't trust the Ukrainian Catholic bishops to be, you know, given an accurate assessment of the situation when they are in Ukraine, uh, you know, hiding for their lives and ministering to God's people in spite of great danger to themselves. I don't know what to say to you, but what I would say is this, even if you don't know where to look for truth, even if you don't know what the facts are, what you can do is not put your trust in Putin. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling anyone that they have to be rooting for Putin to fall. Uh, I personally am rooting for his invasion to fail for the sake of the innocent. But I am saying that if you are putting your faith in Putin, if you're putting your trust in Putin, you're putting it in the wrong place. You are being misled. You are being misled. The fact of the matter is what's going on in Ukraine is a horrible, horrible situation, however you look at it. And rooting for the person who caused this, who's keeping it going, I, I don't think it is a really a tenable stance if you are a person of faith. If you are a follower of Christ, you, you shouldn't be rooting for an invasion that's killing the innocent. You shouldn't be. Now, I also want to be clear on another thing, too. I am not advocating that the United States get into a war with Russia. I mm -hmm. do not want that. I'm not advocating for that at all. Frankly, I think if the United States engaged Russia, it would be a disaster for the entire world. Mm -hmm. I don't see that ending well for anybody. I don't. But at the same time, I think I feel very strongly we have to do what we can um, to support the innocent and to help those who are in need and to be a voice for those who are undergoing tremendous oppression at the moment. And if nothing else, I'm hoping to convince some people here that Putin is not on the right side of history. I know you're not a political analyst or anything like that, but do, do you think that the invasion will fail? I'm just I don't curious. Know for sure, but my, my gut instinct is that it's going very badly for Putin. That's yeah. my gut instinct. Yeah. Um, you know, when this invasion first happened, I saw analysts on television saying that Ukraine would fall within 48 hours or 72 right. hours. Right. We're at three weeks into this now. And Ukraine is still going strong. And it appears to me that, that Russia is kind of stuck. Um, they can't seem to make a whole lot of headway. Um, they're running out of supplies. Uh, from what I read, uh, a lot of the Russian soldiers didn't bring a lot of supplies with them because they were told that they don't, they'd be in and out quick. Or, they're, they're, or many of them were told, actually, to bring their dress uniforms for victory parades in Kiev. Um, they actually were told they'd be welcomed as liberators. In some cases so this has not gone at all like putin planned it to go not at all and that in and of itself might possibly be miraculous mm. uh, that to me is a surprise it's a surprise a pleasant surprise now it's horrible that this continues and that the the bloodshed continues and i think russia out of frustration is is blowing up civilian centers to create psychological terror uh and that's horrific it's horrific. But at the same time, I am pleasantly happy, as much as I can be happy in a nightmare like this, that Ukraine has not fallen. And I don't think it will fall. Even if Russia managed to capture a few cities, like Kiev and a few others perhaps, um, the Ukrainians are not going to stop fighting. They will go into the mountains, they will go into the, into the forests, and they will come out and attack. And, and they will never allow the Russians to have control of that country again. Now, people may be wondering why. Why would the Ukrainians, you know, be so vehemently opposed to Russia controlling their nation? The last time that Russia had control of Ukraine, they starved eight million people to death on purpose. They purposely orchestrated a famine to starve millions of people to death because they're disobedient to the uh, Soviet program. And the people of Ukraine remember this. This is a wound that they carry with them still. They're never going to allow themselves to be controlled by Russia again. Mm. There's some questions here I want to grab from the chat. Um, it just moved now. Let me hold on. Let me get back there. Um, mm, skipping through some of these. Sorry. I, I just had it. Here's good, a good one, though. From a moral standpoint, does Deacon think it would be better for Ukraine to join Russia rather than be influenced by Western countries? No, absolutely not. Um, and again, 
I'm speaking here as a Catholic deacon. Um, if if you want the Ukrainian Catholic Church to survive and to, to live in Ukraine, joining Russia would be its death sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no religious freedom in Russia. Um, so even if, you know, from a moral standpoint, you know, Ukraine becomes a place, you know, where homosexuality is outlawed and transgenderism is outlawed, at the same time, it will not be a place of God because the, the Christian faith will be persecuted. The only ones who will be allowed to function are those who completely subject themselves to the state. And that really is not what Christianity is about. It's not about serving the state. It's about serving God. Joe Kim asks, the question, though, is whether Putin started the war. Wars often don't start how we think they did. Right, right. Um, I, I would say that Putin gave the command to invade both now and also in 2014 when he invaded Crimea. Now, what Putin is claiming is that there were supposedly uh, Ukrainians who were uh, purging ethnic Russians in the eastern parts of Ukraine. Uh, he described it as a genocide. Uh, from what I gather, that is a highly spurious claim. Highly spurious. Um, again, I, I talk to people on the ground in Ukraine. A lot of people who are Russian-speaking Ukrainians from the eastern part of Ukraine are strongly opposed to Russia and want to remain independent as Ukraine. If the Ukrainian government really was doing ethnic cleansing against Russian-speaking Ukrainians, why is it that so many Russian-speaking Ukrainians are so strongly opposed to Russia? I don't buy that. What I have heard is there actually were cases of um, Russian soldiers dressing up in Ukrainian uniforms and filming videos of them attacking uh, you know, Russian homes and Russian buildings and stuff uh, to try and create this narrative to justify the invasion. But again, let's just say for a second that it's true, that, that there really are Nazis running Ukraine and they really are attacking ethnic Russians in the eastern part of Ukraine. If that's the case, why is Putin invading the entire country? And again, that doesn't justify targeting civilians. Can you speak about the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and what they think about what's happening, seeing that they are newly recognized as autocephalous? Well, um, they're very they're very concerned for their future, as are we Ukrainian Catholics. Um, and you know, to a certain degree, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church or the UCO, I think Ukrainian Church of Ukrainian Church, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, yeah, or is it OCU Orthodox Church in Ukraine? I forget what, how it's officially called. But to a certain extent, they know that they're in the crosshairs, uh, just like the Ukrainian Catholics are. Um, there's a, a religious dimension to this entire thing. And you, by the way, wrote a really good article about this not too long ago. It was, it was excellent, by the way. Really excellent. Thank you. But a lot of people are missing the religious dimension of this. So here's part of it people don't realize. Kiev is the mother church of Russia. So I've told the story before, you know, there was Prince Vladimir of Kiev and he sent emissaries around the world to find a religion. And the emissaries that went to Constantinople were deeply impressed by the liturgy and the spirituality. So he adopted the Orthodox faith or at the time, the Eastern Catholic, one could say faith of Constantinople, the Byzantine rite, the Byzantine tradition. When all this happened, uh, Moscow was like a swamp in a forest. There wasn't much of anything in Moscow at the time. But Kiev was a relatively metropolitan area, you know, in comparison at least. Um, and then the faith spread from Kiev to, you know, Russia later on. But the truth is that the Russian Orthodox faith, the Russian Orthodox, um, you know, spirituality, and a lot of the Russian culture actually came from Kiev. That's where it came from. And what happened was at a certain point, uh, Moscow, through some very clever political uh, machinations, managed to somehow jump ahead and become a patriarchate and treat Kiev as being like a daughter church when Kiev was always the mother church. Uh, but again, it was a clever rewriting of history that took place. But because so much of the Russian Orthodox faith, so much of the Russian culture came from Kiev, 
in the Russian mythology and in the Russian mind, um, Kiev belongs to Russia because they're so intertwined historically and culturally. Um, so I think a big part of this is um, the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, Putin, who really is the leader of it in a sense, and Kirill, the, the nominal head of it, um, they, they can't fathom the idea of Kiev being, you know, not just politically, but spiritually separate from Russia. So when the you know, Orthodox Church of Ukraine was declared autocephalous by Patriarch Bartholomew, I think, was it two years ago? Uh, well, yeah, I think it was actually 2018. Okay. No, 2019. I'm sorry, 2019. So th about three years ago now. Yeah. I think when this happened, um, to them, they saw it as a major a major affront that could not go on unanswered. And I can't help but think that part of this is what's feeling the inv invasion. It's definitely not the whole reason, but I think it is part of it. Mm. Mm -hmm. What has been the um, response of Russian Orthodox outside of Russia from what you've seen to what, what's going on? Maybe comment on that if you will to, to my surprise uh, a lot of russian orthodox bishops around the world have stopped commemorating patriarch kirill mm. and that's because patriarch kirill as we discussed is cheerleading the invasion I mean, he gave this homily on forgiveness sunday of all days um mm. you know explaining that ukraine allows gay pride parades to take place therefore the you know, the russian invasion is is in a sense God's wrath against Ukraine for having gay pride parades. So in his morality, um, having or allowing gay pride parades to take place is the unforgivable evil, but it's perfectly fine to bomb innocent children. Um, mm. It's a very, very twisted morality there. And most of the Russian Orthodox bishops in the world, I think, were pretty aghast by the statement. And a lot of them... Uh, and a lot of Orthodox parishes, Russian Orthodox parishes, have stopped commemorating Kirill as well. What yeah. they want from him is a strong condemnation of the invasion. Uh, they want him to take the position of a Christian leader and condemn this this violence and this killing, but he won't. He won't do it. Um, so, from what I gather, most of the Russian Orthodox world that I've seen um, is pretty opposed to the invasion, and they're pretty horrified by the behavior of Patriarch Kirill. But again, on the internet, you find all kinds, and I see a lot of Russian Orthodox people on the internet who are celebrating this as being a great moment for Christianity. Mm. Maximilian asks, are Ukrainian Catholics seen as Western agents by the Orthodox? Um, by some. I mean, there, there are some Orthodox, especially like, you know, of the Russian Orthodox variety who look at Ukrainian Catholics with grave suspicion. But interestingly enough, the Orthodox churches of that region who are not under the Moscow Patriarchate tend to be very, very friendly with Ukrainian Catholics. Um, the, you know, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine and the Ukrainian Catholic Church uh, are in fantastic terms. We get along very, very well. And part of it is the Ukrainian Catholic Church among the Orthodox uh, of Ukraine has a great deal of street credibility. Uh, we're a small group. We're about eight to ten percent of the population of Ukraine, you know, depending on what you look at. Um, but we have tremendous moral authority because they know how we did not give in to the communists. We did not cooperate with them. We allowed ourselves to be martyred as opposed to going along with the evil and how we fought underground for decades to survive. Um, for that reason, Ukrainian Catholics get a lot of respect among the Orthodox of Ukraine who do not bow down to the Patriarchate of Moscow. I've heard some say that, well, this is all because NATO has been expanding its territory and it's right there, you know, threatening the territory of Russia and its borders. So this is why he invaded Ukraine. What do you yeah, think? I've heard that argument as well. Um, so... I'll look at this from a couple of different angles. From one angle, my understanding is that there was no serious movement of Ukraine joining NATO. Uh, Ukraine had asked multiple times and was turned down repeatedly. Uh, as far as I'm aware, they actually stopped asking a couple of years ago. Um, there was no danger of Ukraine joining NATO anytime in the near future. So that pretext doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, but let's say it is true. Let's say that Ukraine actually was moving towards joining NATO. 
um, does that justify an invasion? Does that justify the killing? I, I don't think it does. Hmm. I see one more. Let me um, <clears throat> grab this because I, I don't know if I, I haven't seen this one. In the revealing Ukraine documentary, there's a brief but direct portion of the film suggesting there's a push against the Catholicity of Ukraine, too. Have you seen this before? I have not. I'm not familiar with that. What is it? I It's a documentary. I, I guess we need to check it out. Yeah, I have not heard of that one. That one is new for me. So hmm. I suppose we'll we'll need to look into that one. I don't see any others. I think we cleared out everything from the chat. Oh, one more. I, I don't know if you want to take this one. Didn't Ukraine sign an agreement saying they would not join NATO? Do, do you know by any chance? To the best of my knowledge, they've signed no such agreement. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I'm not an expert on the political side mm -hmm. of things. There might be right. something I'm missing. I know right. that there was the, the one agreement where uh, Ukraine would get rid of its nuclear weapons. Yeah. And in return, uh, you know, the United States and Russia and NATO would respect its territory, um, mm -hmm. whatever that means. But clearly that's been broken. As far as the documentary, they're clarifying it's on Rumble, very pro-Russian, watch cautiously. Okay, so probably a lot of propaganda in it <laughs> in that yeah. case. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, look, I appreciate you coming on and doing this. Uh, you know, go, go ahead and put in a plug for not only your work, but anything else that you want to make us aware of, perhaps where we could go to donate to support Ukrainian Catholics and just Ukrainians in general. Yeah. So right now, the, the Ukrainian Catholic community has been feeling a lot of love. I mean, uh, locally, the, the local Roman Catholic diocese has been really supporting us in a big way. Um, they're having a, for the Annunciation, when um, you know Pope Francis does the consecration, um, our local Roman Catholic bishop is joining in on that, and he invited myself and my pastor to to concelebrate uh, for the Annunciation Mass where this is taking place, which is awesome. Um, I mean, they're they're really showing us a lot of support, a lot of love, and we appreciate that. Um, as for ways to donate to help, um, I know that my eparchy, um, the Saint Joseph at eparchy, is collecting money. Our bishop you know, is working closely with uh, his counterparts in both Ukraine and Poland to help those who are in need, especially the refugees. So if you look up the St. Joseph at Eparchy and go to the website, you'll see information there about how you can give to help. Um, also, two other charities that are, that are great for this is um, Caritas International, as well as the Catholic Near East Welfare Association. Those two groups are also doing outstanding work for the refugees. And here in the United States, if you donate to Catholic Relief Services, that's the, the official uh, charity of the Catholic bishops of the United States. They're also working very closely to support uh, Caritas and helping the refugees. So any of those are a great way to help out. Those are charities where you know the money is actually going to go to the people who need it. Perfect. I'll get some links to those in the description. Once again, thank you so much, Father Deacon, for coming on. I always enjoy these. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate this. And everybody, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Really uh, I would appreciate the support if you would do that. And also check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason in theology, or hit the join button here on YouTube. In order to become a member, you'll get access to extra perks, whichever platform you, you join on. But you'll you'll uh, enable me to continue to do this. So I uh, definitely appreciate the consideration. All right. See y'all later. God bless. Hey, RNT fans, if you're looking to buy a home or sell a home and would like a realtor who shares your beliefs, be sure to check out our sponsor, realestateforlife.org, and be sure to tell them Reason and Theology sent you.